Bing bong, bong, bing bong, bong. This is Joe, the bearded historian. He'll tell you an interesting history. Be careful of his soldiers. They can be brats. This is Angel. She's an entity. She'll cause his us and plant her hands at you. This is Sue. She likes spirits, not the alcohol. She's the reason this channel exists. This is David. He likes fire trucks. He's here occasionally. Bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong. We preserve his story. Welcome to Wayback Wednesday, where Joe has taken a very intense topic. Anyway, it's a long one, so grab a snack. Ready? Here we go. Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. The shout out is for our friend. Let's see who it is today. We got the spinny ball of, or spinny well, or spinny, spinny spinner. That's what it is. That's what it is. Use them there, right round, baby, right round, like a record player, right round, baby. And we got Laura. Okay, it's uh, Song Bits by Laura. Uh, welcome to my channel, Spice for Genuine Contact, Meaningful Conversations, Very Embrace Diversity, and Foster uh, Respectful Discussions. Join me in engaging chats, networking opportunities, Moments of laughter, joy, and occasionally we'll explore crafting creativity while, while simply hanging out. Uh, she's got a Pinterest page, which is fun. Uh, and Instagram, which I'll have to look up. I don't recognize the jot form. I'll have to look that one up. Um, but here is uh, some of her videos. It looks like she was looking at prospecting, which I do not have the patience for. There's a crafting one or a boxing one. Fireworks, of course. Um, so, check her out. Like, share, comment. Hook it. Hang on. All right, Mr. Bud, what do you got to say? Well, today we're going to uh, do a little bit of flashback in time, as we usually do. Uh, this time, though, you know, we're off by just a couple days because the... Uh, there's a lot of details going on, plus a movie coming out that uh, I'm probably the only one that's going to go watch it. Yep. Um, but <clears throat> on the date, July the 16th, 1945, was basically the ushering in of the nuclear age. It was uh, when they made the first Trinity test uh, in New Mexico's Alamogordo bombing range and gunnery range. Uh, at this site, they would look at the designs and uh, specs for what would later become the first atomic bombs. And through the project uh, known as the Manhattan Project, uh, these weapons of mass destruction got their starts. Now, interestingly enough, like everything else in history, the <clears throat> whole process actually had its roots back in 1938, um, when nuclear fission was actually discovered by German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. Uh, and the theoretical explanation by Lise Mittner and Otto Frisch made the development of an atomic bomb a theoretical possibility. Now, there were fears that a German atomic bomb project would develop one first, especially among scientists who were refugees from Nazi Germany and other fascist countries, uh, in August of 1939, Hungarian-born physicist Leo Silzard and Eugene Wigner drafted the einstein silzard letter, which warned of a potential development of an extremely powerful bombs of new type. It urged the United States to take steps to acquire stockpiles of uranium ore and accelerate the research of Enrico Fermi and others into nuclear chain reactions. Well, they signed, uh, they had it signed by Albert Einstein, and delivered it to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States. Roosevelt called on Lyman Briggs of the National Bureau of Standards to head the Advisory Committee on Uranium to investigate the issues raised by the letter. Now, Briggs held a meeting on the 21st of October, 1939, 
which was attended by Silzard Wigner and Edward Teller. The committee reported back to Roosevelt in November that uranium would provide a possible source of bombs with destructiveness vastly greater than anything now known. What? They were not kidding. No, well, they were not. In February of 1940, the U.S. Navy awarded Columbia University 6000 in funding, most of which in Yurko Fermi and Silzard spent on purchasing graphite. A team of Columbia professors, including Fermi, Silzard, Eugene T. Booth, and John Dunning, created the first nuclear fission reaction in the Americas, verifying the work of Hahn and Strassmann, and the same team subsequently built a series of prototype nuclear reactors, or piles, as Fermi called them, in Poopin Hall in College in Columbia. But they were not yet able to achieve the chain reaction. Uh, the Advisor Committee on Uranium became the National Defense Research Committee on Uranium when that organization was formed on the 27th of June, 1940. Now, Briggs proposed spending $167,000 on research into uranium, particularly the uranium-235 isotope and uh, plutonium, which was discovered in 1940 at the University of California. On the 28th of June, 1941, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8807, which created the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Now, realize this whole time, the U.S. was still at peace. Pearl Harbor hadn't happened yet. Uh, Germany had already invaded Poland. Uh, you know, there was a lot of things that... Basically, it was just kind of... We're over here. We're bored. We're playing with stuff. We're doing lend -lease. We're also playing with uh, the, the, the opening act of uh, how to build nuclear weapons. Well, on the 28th of June, uh, after the Office of Scientific Research and Development was founded... Uh, Venevar Bush was its first director. The office was empowered to engage in large engineering projects in addition to research. Now, the NDRC Committee on Uranium became the S1 section of the OSRD. The word uranium was dropped for security reasons. Over in Britain, meanwhile, Frisch and Rudolf Claris at the University of Birmingham had made a breakthrough investigating the critical mass of a uranium-235 in June of 1939, their calculations indicated that it was within the order of magnitude of 10 kilograms, or 22 pounds, which was small enough to be carried by a bomber of the day. Their 1940 uh, in March, Fresh Polaris Memorandum initiated the British Atomic Bomb Project and its MOD Committee, which unanimously recommended pursuing the development of an atomic bomb. In July of 1940, British had offered to give the United States access to its scientific research, and the Tizard Mission's John Kalkoff briefed the American scientists on British developments. He discovered that the American project was smaller than the British and not as far as advanced, so the British actually had us, uh, were ahead of us in the game. As part of the scientific exchange, the MOD Committee's findings were conveyed to the United States. One of its members, the Australian physicist Mark Oliphant, flew to the U.S. in late August 1941 and discovered that data provided by physicists and the MOD committee had not yet reached the key American physicists. Oliphant then set to find out why the committee's findings were apparently being ignored. He met with the Uranium Committee and visited Berkeley, where he spoke persuasively to Ernest O. Lawrence. Lawrence was sufficiently impressed to commence his own research into uranium. He, in turn, spoke to James B. Conant, Arthur H. Compton, and G. B. Pagram. Oldman's mission, therefore, was a success. Key American physicists were now aware of the potential power of an atomic bomb. On the 9th of October, 1941, President Roosevelt approved the atomic program after he convened a meeting with Venevar Bush and Vice President Harry A. Wallace. To control the program, he created a top policy group consisting of himself, although he never attended a meeting, Wallace, Bush, Conant, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, and the Chief of Staff of the Army, General George C. Marshall. Roosevelt chose, chose the Army to run the project rather than the Navy because the Army had more experience with management of large-scale construction projects. He also agreed to coordinate the effort with that of the British, and on the 11th of October, he sent a message to Prime Minister Winston Churchill suggesting that they correspond on atomic matters. Now, the S-1 Committee 
which uh, held its meeting on the 18th of December, 1941, 18th of December, pervaded the atmosphere of enthusiasm and urgency in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent United States declaration of war upon Japan and then on Germany. Work was proceeded in three different techniques for isotope separation to separate uranium-235 from the more abundant uranium-238. Lawrence and his team at the University of California investigated electromagnetic separation, while Iger Murphy and Jesse Wakefield Beam's team looked into the gaseous diffusion at Columbia University, and Philip Abelson directed research into thermal diffusion at the Carnegie Institute of Washington and later the Naval Research Laboratory. Murphy was also the head of the unsuccessful separation project using gas centrifuges. Meanwhile, there were two lines of research into nuclear reactor technology with Harold Urey conducting research into heavy water at Columbia, while Arthur Compton brought the scientists working under his supervision from Columbia, California, and Princeton University to join his team at the University of Chicago, where they organized the Metallurgical Laboratory in early 1942 to study plutonium and reactors using graphite as a neutron mo moderator. Briggs, Compton, Lawrence, Murphy, and Urey met on the 23rd of May, 1942, to finalize the S-1 committee's recommendations, which calls for all five technologies to be pursued. This was approved by Bush, Conant, and Brigadier General Wilhelm D. Steyer, the D Chief of Staff, Major General Brayton B. Somerville's supply Services of Supply, who had been designated as the Army's representative on nuclear matters. Bush and Conant then took the recommendation to the top policy group with a budget proposal for $54 million for construction by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, $31 million for research and development by OSRD, and $5 million for contingencies in the fiscal year 1943. The top policy group sent it on 17th of June 1942 to the president, who approved it by writing OK FDR on the document. <laughs> OK FDR. That's subtle. <laughs> OK. I approve it. And by typing, okay. Exactly. Now, Compton asked theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer of the University of California to take over research into fast neutron calculations, the key to calculations of critical mass and weapon detonation from George, from Gregory Barrett, who had quit on the 18th of May, 1942, because of concerns over lax operational security. John H. Manley, a physicist at the Metallurgical Laboratory, was assigned to assist Oppenheimer, by con contacting and coordinating experimental physics groups scattered across the country. Oppenheimer and Robert Serber of the University of Illinois examined the problems of neutron diffusion, how neutrons moved in a nuclear chain reaction in hydrodynamics, how, to, how the explosion produced in the chain reaction might behave. Let's see what we can do by blowing things up. Um, to review the work in the general theory of fission reactions, Oppenheimer and Fermi convened their meetings at the University of Chicago in June and at the University of California in July of 1942 with theoretical physicists Hans Berthe, John Van Gleek, Edward Teller, Emil Komaninsky, Robert Serber, Stan Frankel, and Eldred C. Carlisle Nelson, the latter three former students of Oppenheimer and experimental physicists Emilio Sergi, Felix Bloch, Fra Franco Rossetti, John Henry Manley, and Edwin McMillan. They theoretically confirmed that a fission bomb was theoretically possible. However, there were still many unknown factors. The properties of pure uranium-235 were relatively unknown, as were those of plutonium, an element that they have only discovered in February of 1941 by Glenn Seaborg and his team. The scientists at Berkeley Conference envisioned creating a plutonium envisioned creating plutonium in nuclear reactors where uranium-238 atoms absorbed neutrons that had been emitted from fissioning uranium-235 atoms. At this point, no reactor had been built, and there was only tiny quantities of plutonium that were available from cyclotrons at institutions such as Washington University in St. Louis. Even by December of 1943, only two milligrams had ever been produced. There were many ways of arranging the fizzle material into a critical mass. The simplest was shooting a cylindrical plug into a sphere of active material with a tamper-dense material that would, that would focus neutrons inward and keep the reacting mass together to increase its efficiency. 
They explored designs involving spheroids, a primitive form of implosion suggested by Richard C. Tolman, and the possibility of autocatalytic methods, which would increase the efficiency of the bomb as it exploded. Considering the idea of the fission bomb theoretically settled, at least until more experimental data was available, the 1942 Berkeley Conference then turned in a different direction. Edward Teller pushed for a discussion on a more powerful bomb, the super, now usually referred to as a hydrogen bomb, which would use the explosive force of a detonating fission bomb to ignite a nuclear fusion reaction in deuterium and tritium. Teller proposed scheme after scheme, but Beth refused each one. The fusion idea was put aside to concentrate on producing fission bombs. Teller also raised the speculative possibility that an atomic bomb might ignite the atmosphere because of a hypothetical fusion reaction of nitrogen nuclei. Belf calculated that this, it could not happen, and a report co-authored by Teller showed that no self-propagating chain of nuclear reactions is likely to be started. In Cerber's account, Oppenheimer mentioned the possibility of this scenario to Arthur Compton, who didn't have enough sense to shut up about it. It somehow got into a document that went to Washington. It was never laid to rest. Now, the chief of engineers, Major General Eugene Reibold, selected Colonel James C. Marshall to head the Army's part of the project in June of 1942. Marshall created a liaison office in Washington, D.C., but established his temporary headquarters on the 18th floor of 270 Broadway in New York, where he could draw on the administrative support from the Corps of Engineers North Atlantic Division. It was close to the Manhattan office of Stone and Weber, a principal project coordinator, and the Columbia University. He had permission to draw on his former command, the Syracuse District, for staff, and he started with Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth, Kenneth Nichols, who became his deputy. Because most of this task involved construction, Marshall worked in cooperation with the head of Corps of Engineers Construction Division, Major General Thomas M. Robbins, and his deputy, Colonel Leslie Groves. Raybould, Somerville, and Steyer decided to call the project the development of substitute materials, but Groves felt this would draw attention. Since engineer districts normally carried the name of the city where it was located, Marshall and Groves agreed to name the Army's component of the project the Manhattan District. This became official on the 13th of August when Raybould issued the order creating the new district. Informally, it was known as the Manhattan Engineer District, or MED. Unlike other districts, it had no geographic boundaries, and the marshal had the authority of a division engineer. Development substitute materials remained as the official code name of the project, but it was supplanted over time by Manhattan. Marshall later conceded that I had never heard of atomic fission, but I did know that you could not build much of a plant, much less four of them, for $90 million. A single TNT plant that Nichols had recently built in Pennsylvania had cost $128 million. Nor were they impressed by the estimates of the near, nearest order of magnitude, which Groves compared with, compared with telling a caterer to prepare between 10 and 10, 000, a meal for 10 and 10,000 guests. A survey team from Stone and Weber had already scouted a site for production plants. The War Production Board recommended uh, sites around Knoxville, Tennessee, an isolated area where the Tennessee Valley Authority could provide ample electric power and the rivers could provide cooling water for the reactors. After examining several sites, the survey team selected one near Elza, Tennessee. Conn had advised that it be acquired at once, and Steyer agreed, uh, but Marshall temporized, waiting for the results of the prospective processes. Only Lawrence's electromagnetic separation appeared sufficiently advanced for construction to commence. Marshall and Nichols began assembling the resources that they would need. The first step was to obtain a high-priority rating for the project. The top ratings were AA1 through AA4 in descending order, although there was a special AAA rating reserved for emergencies. Ratings AA1 and AA2 were essential weapons and equipment, so Colonel Lucius D. Clay, the Deputy Chief of Staff of Services of Supply for the requirements and resources, felt the highest rating that they could assign was uh, AA3, although he was willing to provide a AAA rating on request for critical materials if the need arose. Nichols and uh, Marshall were disappointed. AA3 was the same priority as Nichols' T TNT plant in Pennsylvania. Mm. Now, Venevar Bush became dissatisfied with Colonel Marshall's failure to get the project moving expeditiously. 
uh, specifically the failure to acquire the Tennessee site of the low priority allocated to the project by the Army and the location of his headquarters in New York City. Bush felt a more aggressive leadership was required and spoke to Harvey Bundy about uh, Generals Marshall, Somerville, and Steyer about his concerns. He wanted the project placed under a senior policy committee with a prestigious offering, preferably Steyer as overall director. Somerville and Steyer selected Groves for the post, informing him on the 17th of September of his decision, and General Marshall ordered that he be promoted to Brigadier General. He always felt the title General would hold more sway with the academic scientists working on the Manhattan Project. Groves' orders placed him directly under Somerville rather than Ribold, with, with Colonel Marshall now answerable to Groves. Groves established the headquarters in D.C. on the fifth floor of the new War uh, Department building, where Colonel Marshall had his liaison office. He assumed command of the Manhattan Project on the 23rd of September, 1942. Later that day, he attended a meeting called by Simpson, which established a military policy committee responsible for the top policy group consisting of Bush, which Conant was an uh, alternate, Steyer and Rear Admiral William R. Purnell. Tolman and Conant were later appointed as Groves' scientific advisors. On the 19th of September, Groves went to Donald Nelson, the chairman of the War Production Board, and asked for broad authority to issue a AAA rating whenever it was required. Nelson initially balked, but quickly caved when Groves threatened to go to the president. I'm going to tell on you. I'm telling. Uh, Groves promised not to use the AAA rating unless it was necessary. It was soon transpired that this was routine requirements of the project that AAA was too high, but the AA-3 was too low. After a campaign, Groves finally received the AA-1 authority on the 1st of July, 1944. This is getting awful close to when they're going to need this thing, you know. Time's a ticket. Good to go, yeah. According to Groves in D.C., you became aware of the importance of a top priority. Most everything proposed in the Roosevelt administration would have top priority. This was the last... This would last for about a week or two, and something else would get top priority. One of Grove's early problems was to find a director for Project Y. The group would design and build the bomb. The obvious choice was one of the three laboratory heads, Uri, Lawrence, or Compton, but they could not be spared. Compton recommended Oppenheimer, who is already intimately familiar with the bomb concepts. However, Oppenheimer had little administrative experience, and unlike Uri, Lawrence, and Compton had not won a Nobel Prize, which many scientists felt was the head of such an important laboratory should have. They were also concerned about Oppenheimer's security status, as many of his associates were communists, including his wife, Kitty, his girlfriend, Jean Tallock, and his brother, Frank Oppenheimer. A long conversation on a train in October 1942 convinced Groves and Nichols that Oppenheimer thoroughly understood the issues involved in setting up a laboratory in a remote area and should be per uh, appointed its director. Groves personally waived the security requirements and issued Oppenheimer a clearance on the 20th of July, 1943. Now, meanwhile, the British and Americans had been exchanging nuclear information but did not initially combine their efforts. Britain rebuffed attempts by Bush and Conn in 1941 to strengthen the cooperation with its own project, nicknamed uh, Tube Alloys, because it was reluctant to share the technological lead and help the United States develop its own atomic bomb. But the British who had made significant contributions early in the war, did not have the resources to carry out such research program while fighting for their survival, and the two alloys soon fell behind its American's counterpart. The role of the two countries was reversed, and in January 1943, Conant notified the British that they were no longer received atomic information except in certain areas. The British investigated the possibility of an independent nuclear program, but determined it could not be ready in time to affect the outcome of the war in Europe. By March 1943, Conant decided the British help would benefit in some areas of the project. James Chadwick and one or two other British scientists were important enough that the bomb design team at Los Alamos needed them, despite the risk of revealing weapon design secrets. In August of 43, Churchill and Roosevelt negotiated the Quebec Agreement, which resulted in a resumption of cooperation and the subsequent Hyde Park Agreement in September 44 extended the cooperation to the post-war period. The Quebec Agreement established a combined policy committee to coordinate the efforts of the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada. Stimson, Bush, and Conant served as the American members of the combined policy committee. Field Marshal Sir John Dill and Colonel J.J. Ulan 
were the British members, and C.D. Howe was the Canadian member. Lewin returned to the United Kingdom at the end of 43 and was replaced on the committee by Sir Ronald Ian Campbell, who in turn was replaced by the British ambassador to the United States, Lord Halifax, in early 45. Sir John Dill died in Washington, D.C. in November 1944 and was replaced both as the chief and the British Joint Staff Mission and as a member of the Combined Policy by Field Marshal Sir Henry Maitland Wilson. With, co with cooperation resumed after the Quebec Agreement, Americans' progress and expenditures amazed the British. Chadwick pressed for British involvement in the Manhattan Project to the fullest extent and abandoned any hopes of the independent British project during the war. With Churchill's backing, he attempted to ensure that every request from Groves for assistance was honored. The British mission that arrived in the United States in December of 43 included Niels Bohr, Otto Frisch, Klaus Fuchs, Rudolf Polaris, and Ernest Titterton. More scientists arrived in early 1944. All those assigned to the gaseous diffusion left by the fall of 44, the 35 working under Oliphant with Lawrence of Berkeley were assigned to the existing laboratory groups and stayed mostly till the end of the war. The 19 sent to Los Alamos also joined existing groups, primarily related to the implosion and bomb assembly, but not the plutonium-related ones. The Quebec Agreement specified that nuclear weapons would not be used against another country without the mutual consent of the U.S. and the U.K. In June of 1945, Wilson agreed that the use of nuclear weapons against Japan would be recorded as a decision of the Combined Policy Committee. Now, the Combined Policy Committee created the Combined Development Trust in June of 1944 with Groves as its chairman to procure uranium and thorium ores from international markets. The Belgian Congo and Canada held much of the world's uranium outside of Eastern Europe, and the Belgian government in exile was in London. Britain agreed to give the United States most of its Belgian ore, as it could not use most of the supply without restricted American research. In 1944, the trust purchased 3.4 million pounds of uranium oxide ore from companies operating mines in the Belgian Congo. The order to avoid briefing U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Mogenthal, on the project, a special account not subject to the usual auditing and controls, was used to hold trust monies and between 1944 and the time he resigned from the trust in 47, Groves deposited a total of 37.5 million into the trust account. Hey, did you guys see where that money went to? I, I misplaced my money. Uh, yeah, just a little pocket change there. Do you, will you take a check? No, use the credit card. You get frequent flyer miles. Ooh. Groves appreciated the early British atomic research and the British scientists' contributions to the Manhattan Project, but stated... The United States would have succeeded without them. The British wartime participation was crucial to the success of the United Kingdom's independent nuclear weapons program after the war when the McMahon Act of 1946 temporarily ended the American nuclear cooperation. Now, a lot of the history that we have, of course, deals with Oak Ridge, which was the primary site in Tennessee where they were doing a lot of the work. Uh, however, there were other locations that they had projects working. Uh, Richland up in Washington. Uh, there was one in Utah called Wendover. Uh, Uravan in Colorado. Monticello in Utah. Uh, Inukem in California as well as Berkeley. Uh, Los Alamos was the big brother. Almagordo. Almagordo. Uh, Ames in Iowa. And there was a site in St. Louis. Uh, Chicago had the uh, metallurgical laboratory. Uh, there was a project in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Morgantown had the Oregon Ordnance Works. And even a place in Alabama had Ordnance Works as well. So it, it wasn't just one location that was taking care of everything. They, they had a lot of different parts that were working on the whole project. Not just, uh, you know, everybody's like, well, it was just in two places. No, it was actually quite a few. You know? And then, of course, Los Alamos was where a lot of it was assembled and worked with. Now, the day after he took over the project, Groves took a train to Tennessee with Colonel Marshall to inspect the proposed site there, and Groves was impressed. On the 29th of September, 1942, the United States Under Secretary of War Robert P. Patterson authorized the Corps of Engineers to acquire 56,000 acres. Hey, let's take that big piece of land there. I'm just going to take this, the butter one. <laughs> just going to borrow it, that's all. And here's the fun part. By eminent domain. Mine. 
uh, at the cost of $3.5 million. An additional 3,000 acres was subsequently acquired. And about 1,000 families were affected by the condemnation order, which came into effect on the 7th of October. Uh, protests, legal appeals, and a 1943 congressional inquiry into, was to no avail. By mid-November, the U.S. Marshals were tacking notices to vacate on farmhouse doors the construction contractors were moving in. <clears throat> Some families were given two weeks' notice to vacate the farms that had been their home for generations. Others had settled while, after being evicted to make way for the Great Smoky Mountain National Park in the 1920s or the Norris Dam in the 30s. The ultimate cost of land acquisition in the area, which was not completed until March of 1945, was only about $2.6 million, which had worked out to about $47 an acre. When presented to the public proclamation number two, which was declared Oak Ridge a total exclusion area that no one could enter without military permission, the governor of Tennessee, Prentice Cooper, angrily tore it up. Screw you, government. Oops. Initially known as the Kingston Demolition Range, the site was officially renamed the Clinton Engineer Works in early 43. While Stone and Webster concentrated on the production facilities, the agriculture and engineering firm Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill designed and built a residential community for 13,000 people. The community was located on the slopes of the Black Oak Ridge, which is where the new town Oak Ridge got its name. The Army presence at Oak Ridge increased in 43. In August, as Nichols replaced Marshall as the head of the Manhattan Engineer District, one of his first tasks was to move the district of headquarters to Oak Ridge, although the name of the district did not change. In September of 43, the Administration of Community Facilities was outsourced to Turner Construction Company through a subsidiary, Rowan Anderson Company for Rowan and Anderson Counties, in which Oak Ridge was located. Chemical engineers, including William J. Jenkins Wilcox, Jr. and William Fuchs, were part of the frantic efforts to make the 10 to 12 percent ur enriched uranium <coughs> 235 known as the code name Tabale Tetroxide with tight security and fast approvals for supplies and materials. The population of Oak Ridge soon expanded well beyond the initial plans and peaked at 75,000 people in May of 1945. Uh, by at which time the uh, 82,000 people were employed at the Clinton Engineer Works and 10,000 by Rowan Anderson. A fine arts uh, photographer, Josephine Herrick, and her colleague, Mary Steers, helped document the work at the Oak Ridge. Now, the idea of locating Project Y at the Oak Ridge was considered, but in the end it was decided that it should be a remote location. On Oppenheimer's recommendation, his search for a suitable site was narrowed to the vicinity of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Oppenheimer owned a ranch. In October of 42, Major John H. Dudley of the Manhattan District sent a survey to the area. He recommended a site near Jimenez Springs, New Mexico. On the 16th of November, Oppenheimer, Groves, Dudley, and others toured the site. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer feared that the high cliffs surrounding the site would make his people feel claustrophobic, while the engineers were concerned about the possibility of flooding. The party then moved to, on to the vicinity of the Los Alamos Ranch School. Oppenheimer was impressed and expressed a strong preference for the site, citing the natural beauty and views of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which, it hoped, would inspire those to work on the project. The engineers were concerned about the poor access road and whether the water supply would be adequate, but otherwise felt it was ideal. Patterson approved the acquisition of the site on uh, the 25th of November, 1942, authorizing $440,000 for the purchase of the site of 54,000 acres, all but 8,900 acres which were already owned by the federal government. Secretary of Agriculture uh, Claude R. Wicker granted the use of some 45,000 acres of United States Forest Service land to the War Department for so long as the military necessity continues. The need for the land for a new road and later the right-of-way for a 25-mile power line eventually brought wartime purchases to 45737 acres, but only $414,000 was spent. Just a, that, that's such a type of pocket change. Pocket change, yeah, for these guys. Construction was contracted to the M.M. Stunt Company of Tucson, Arizona, with William, Will, Willard C. Kruger and Associates of Santa Fe as architects and engineers. Work commenced in December of 1942. Uh, Groves initially allocated 300000 for construction, three times Oppenheimer's estimate, 
but the planned completion date of the 15th of March, 1943. Three, it soon became clear that the scope of Project Y was greater than expected, and by the time Stunt finished on the 30th of November, over $7 million had been spent. Now, because it was secret, Los Alamos was referred to the Site Y, or The Hill. Birth certificates of babies born in Los Alamos during the war listed their place of birth as P.O. Box 1663 in Santa Fe. Initially, Los Alamos was a military laboratory with Oppenheimer and other researchers commissioned into the Army. Oppenheimer went so far as to order himself a lieutenant colonel's uniform, but two key physicists, Robert Bacher and Isidore Robbie, balked at the idea. Conant, Groves, and Oppenheimer then devised a compromise whereby the laboratory was operated by the University of California under contract to the War Department. Now, an Army OSRD Council on the 25th of June in 1942 decided to build a pilot plant for the plutonium production in Red Gate Woods, southwest of Chicago. In July, Nichols arranged for a lease of 1,025 acres from the Cook County Forest Preserve District, and Captain James F. Grafton was appointed to the Chicago area engineer. It soon became apparent that the scale of operations was too great for the area, and it was decided to build the plant at Oak Ridge to keep a, and keep a research and testing facility in Chicago. No. Now, delays in establishing a plant at Redgate Woods led Compton to authorize the Metallurgical Laboratory to construct the first nuclear reactor beneath the bleachers of Stagg Field at the University of Chicago. Now, this reactor required an enormous amount of graphite blocks and uranium pellets. At the time, there was a limited source of pure uranium. Frank Spedding of Iowa State University was able to produce only two short tons of pure uranium. Additional three short tons of uranium metal was supplied by the Westinghouse Lamp Plant, which was produced in a rush with a makeshift process. A large square balloon was constructed by Goodyear Tire to encase the reactor. And on the 2nd of December, 1942, a team led by Eureka Fermi initiated the first artificial self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction in an experimental reactor known as Chicago Pile 1. The point at which the reaction became self-sustaining became known as going critical. No. Compton reported the success to Conant in Washington, D.C. by a coded phone call saying, the Italian navigator Fermi has just landed in a new world. Now, in 1943, in January, Grafton's successor, Marjor Marshal Arthur V. Peterson, ordered Chicago Pile 1 dismantled and reassembled at the Red Gate Woods as he regarded the operation of the reactor too hazardous for a densely populated area. Smart man. Yeah. At the Argonne site, the Chicago Pile 3, the first heavy water reactor, went critical on the 15th of May, 1944. After the war, the operations that remained at Redgate moved to a new site at the Argonne National Laboratory about six miles away. Interestingly enough, and I saw this today, the actual now reactor that the first one that they used was disassembled and buried under the ground, and there's now markers because they had to rebury it and embed it in concrete, but there's now a location for it where it actually says, you know, no digging in this location for some reason. You know, oh. some idiot out there wanted a souvenir. I still say we should go digging. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, by December 42, there was major concerns that even Oak Ridge would be too close to a major population center in the unlikely event a major nuclear accident. Groves recruited DuPont in November of 1942 to be the prime contractor for the construction of this plutonium production complex. DuPont was offered a standard cost plus fixed fee contract, but the president of the company, Walter S. Carpenter, wanted no profit of any kind and asked for the proposed contract to be amended to explicitly exclude the company from acquiring any patent rights. This was accepted, but for legal reasons, a nominal fee of $1 was agreed upon. After the war, DuPont asked to be released from the contract early and had to return 33 cents. Oh, man. DuPont recommended that the site be located far from the existing uranium production facility at Oak Ridge. In December of 42, Groves dispatched Colonel Frank Mathias and DuPont engineers to scout potential sites. Mathias reported that the Hanford site near Richland, Washington was ideal. In virtually all respects, it was isolated and near the Columbia River, which could supply 
sufficient water to cool the reactors and that would produce the plutonium. Gross visited the site in January and established the Hanford Engineer Works, codenamed Site W. Uh, you, under Secretary Pre, uh, Patterson gave the approval on the 9th of February, allocating another $5 million to the acquisition of 430,000 acres of land in the area. The government relocated some 1,500 residents of White Bluffs and Hanford and nearby settlements, as well as the Wampum and other tribes using the area. A dispute arose uh, with farmers over compensation for crops, which had already been planted before the land was acquired. Where schedules allowed, the Army allowed the crops to be harvested, but this was not always possible. The land acquisition process dragged on and was not completed before the end of the Manhattan Project in December of 1946. The dispute did not delay work, although progress in the reactor design in the Metallurgical Laboratory in DuPont was not sufficiently advanced to accurately predict the scope of the project. A start was made in April of 43 on facilities for an estimated 25,000 workers, half of whom were expected to live on site. By July 1944, some 1,200 buildings had been, erected, had been erected, and nearly 51,000 people were living in the construction camp. An area engineer, Matthias, exercised overall control on the site, and at its peak, the construction camp was the third most populous town in Washington state. Hanford operated a fleet of over 900 buses, mo more than the city of Chicago, and like Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, Richland was a gated community with restricted access, but looked more like a typical wartime American boon town. The military profile was lower, the physical security elements like high fences, towers, and guard dogs were less evident. Now, interestingly enough, some of the Canadian sites uh, that they did find uh, uses for, Kamiko in British Columbia had produced electro electrolytic hydrogen at Trail, British Columbia, since 1930. Yuri suggested in 1941 that it could produce heavy water. To the existing 10 million plant consisting of 3,215 cells consuming 75 uh, megawatts of hydroelectric power, secondary electrosis cells were added to increase the deuterium concentration in the water from 2.3% to 99.8%. For this process, Hugh Taylor of Princeton developed a platinum on carbon catalyst for the first three stages, while Yuri developed a nickel chromia for one of the fourth stage towers. The final cost was 2.8 million. The Canadian government did not officially learn of the project until August of 1942. Trail's heavy water production started in January 1944 uh, continued until 1956. Heavy water from trail was used for the Chicago Pile 3, the first reactor using heavy water and natural uranium, which went critical. Now in our Ontario, the Chalk River site was established to rehouse the Allied effort at the Montreal la uh, Laboratory away from the uh, urban area. A new community was built at Deep River, Ontario to provide residences and facilities for team members. The site was chosen for its proximity to the industrial manufacturing area of Ontario and Quebec and proximity to a railhead adjacent to a large military base, Camp Pentawada. Located on the Ottawa River, it had access to abundant water. The first director of this new laboratory was Hans von Halben. He was replaced by John Cockroft in 1944 in May, who in turn was succeeded by Bennett Lewis in September of 1946. A pilot reactor known as ZEEP, Zero Energy Experimental Pile, became the first Canadian reactor and the first to be completed outside of the United States when it went critical in September 1945. ZEEP remained in use by researchers until 1970. Uh, a larger 10 megawatt NRX reactor, which was designed during the war, was completed and went critical in 1947 in July. And there was also the El Dorado mine at Port Radium, which was a source of uranium ore in the Northwest Territories that helped. Now, although the DuPont's preferred designs for the nuclear reactors was a helium-cooled and used graphite as a moderator, DuPont still expressed interest in using heavy water as a backup in case the graphite reactor design proved infeasible for some reasons. For this purpose, an estimated three short tons of heavy water would be required per month. The P9 project was the government's code name for the heavy water production program as the plant at Trail, uh, which was under construction, could produce 0.5 short tons per month. 
Additional capacity was required. Groves therefore authorized DuPont to establish heavy water facilities at Morgantown Ordnance Work near Morgantown, West Virginia, at the Wabash River Ordnance Works near Dana in Newport, Indiana, and at the Alabama Ordnance Works near Childersburg in Siliquia, Alabama. Although the Ordnance Works were uh, paid for under the Ordnance Department contracts, they were built and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The American plants used a process different from the trails. Heavy water was extracted by distillation, taking advantage of a slightly higher boiling point of heavy water. Now, uranium, one of our happy products, is a key uh, material for the project, uh, was used as fuel for the reactors as feed that transported the plutonium in an enriched form for the atomic bomb itself. There were four known major deposits of uranium in 1940 uh, in Colorado, in northern Canada, in Jokoshmal in Czechoslovakia, and in the Belgian Congo. All but Jokoshmal were in Allied hands. In November 1942, the survey determined that a sufficient quantity of uranium was available to satisfy the project's requirements. And Nichols arranged with the State Department to export controls be placed on the uranium oxide and negotiated for the purchase of 1,200 short tons of the mine from the Belgian Congo and it would be stored in warehouse on Staten Island and the remaining stocks of mined ore stored in the Congo. He negotiated with El Dorado Gold Mines for the purchase of ore from its refinery in Port Hope, Ontario, and the shipment of 100-ton lots. The Canadian government subsequently bought up the company's stock until it acquired a controlling interest. Interestingly enough, later on, South Dakota would also have uh, uranium in about two different locations, yeah. and they were paying for the uh, radioactive debris for years afterwards. Now, on to another side of the topics, because they were dealing with uranium and how to take and make it available for uh, fission and other purposes. There we go. Now, plutonium was the second line of development pursued by the Manhattan Project using fizzle element plutonium. Now, while small amounts of plutonium will exist in nature, the best way to obtain large quantities... Uh, of the element is in a nuclear reactor in which natural uranium is bombarded by neutrons. The uranium-238 is transmuted into uranium-239, which rapidly decays, first into neptunium-239 and then into plutonium-239. Only a small amount of uranium-238 would be transformed, so the plutonium must be chemically separated from the, uranium, the remaining uranium from any initial impurities and from fission products. Now, in 1943, DuPont began the construction of a plutonium plant on a 112-acre site at the Oak Ridge, intended as a pilot plant for larger production facilities, it included an air-cooled X-10 graphite reactor, chemical separation plant support facilities because of the subsequent decision to construct water-cooled reactors at, Har at Hanford. Only the chemical separation plant uh, operated as a true pilot. The X-10 graphic rea graphite reactor consisted of a large block of graphite, 24 feet long, on each side, weighing about 1,500 short tons, surrounded by 7 feet of high-density concrete as a radiation shield. Now, the greatest difficulty encountered with the uranium slugs produced by the McEnroe and metal hydrates, uh, this somehow had to be coated in aluminum to avoid the corrosion and the escape of fission products into the cooling system. The Gaselli Chem Chemical Company attempted to develop a hot dipping process without success. Meanwhile, Alcoa tried canning. A new process for a fluxless welding was developed, and 97% of the cans passed a standard vacuum test, but the high temperature test indicated a failure rate of more than 50%. Nonetheless, production began in June of 1943. The Metallurgical Laboratory eventually developed an improved welding technique with the help of General Electric, which was incorporated into the production process in October of 43. Watched by Fermi and Compton, the X-10 graphic reactor went critical on the 4th of November 1943 with about 30 short tons of uranium. A week later, the load was increased to 36 short tons, raising its power generation to 500 kilowatts, and by the end of the month, the first 500 milligrams of plutonium was created. Uh, <clears throat> modifications over the time increased the power to 4,000 kilowatts in January of 44, and the X-10 operated 
as a production plant until January 45 when it was turned over to the research activities. Uh, although the air cool design at the Hanford reactors uh, was chosen for the reactor at Oak Ridge to facilitate rapid construction, it was, much, it was recognized that this would be impractical for much larger production reactors. Initial designs for the metallurgical laboratory that DuPont used helium for cooling before they determined that a water-cooled reactor would be ch simpler, cheaper, and quicker to build. This design did not become available until the 4th of October 1943. In the meantime, Matthias concentrated on improving the Hanford site by erecting accommodations, improving the roads, building a railway switch line, and upgrading the electricity, water, and telephone lines. As with the Oak Ridge, the most difficulty that was encountered while canning the uranium slugs was which commenced at Hanford in 1944, they were pickled to remove dirt and impurities dipped in molten bronze, tin, and an aluminum silicone alloy canned using hydraulic presses and then capped using arc welding under an argon atmosphere. Finally, they were subjected to a series of tests to detect holes or faulty welds. Disappointingly, most canned slugs initially failed the test, resulting in an output of only a handful of canned slugs per day. But steady progress was made. By June of 44, production increased to the point where it appeared that enough canned slug would be available to start Reactor B on schedule in August of 44. Now work began on the Reactor B, the first of six planned 250-megawatt reactors on the 10th of October 1943. The reactor complexes were given designations of A through F, with B, D, and F sites chosen to be developed first as this maximized the distance between the reactors. They would be the only ones constructed during the Manhattan Project. Some 390 short tons of concrete, 50,000 concrete blocks, and 71,000 concrete block bricks were used to construct the 120-foot high building. Now, construction of the reactor itself commenced on the, on, uh, in February of 1944. Watched by Compton, Matthias, and DuPont's Crawford Greenwald, Leona Wood, Woods, and Fermi, who inserted the first slug, the reactor was powered up beginning on the 13th of September, 1944. Over the next few days, 838 tubes were loaded and the reactor went critical. Shortly before midnight on the 27th of September, the operators began to withdraw the, cro the control rods to initiate production. At first, all appeared well, but about 3 o'clock, the power level started to drop and by 6.30 the reactor had shut down completely. The cooling water was investigated to see if there was a leak or contamination. The next day the reactor started up again only to shut down once more. Now Fermi contacted Shang Xu Wu who identified the cause of the problem as a as neutron poisoning from the Xeon 135 which has a half-life of 9.2 hours. Fermi, Woods, Donald J. Hughes, and John Archibald Wheeler then calculated the nuclear cross-section of Xeon-135, which turned out to be 30,000 times of uranium. Thanks. Yeah. DuPont engineer George Graves had deviated from the metallurgical lab's original design, to which the reactor had 1,500 tubes arranged in a circle, and had added an additional 504 tubes to fill in the corners. That's a lot this, of tubes. Yeah. The scientists had originally considered over-re-engineering a waste of time and money, but Fermi realized that by loading all 2,004 tubes, the reactor could reach the nuclear, reach the uh, required power level and efficiently produce plutonium. Reactor D was started on the 17th of December, 1944, and Reactor F on the 25th of February, 1945. Woo! And meanwhile, everybody else in this neighborhood is wondering what's going to happen if this thing ever goes critical. Uh, boom. Big boom. Meanwhile, chemists uh, considered the problem of how plutonium could be separated from uranium when its chemical properties were not known. Working with the minute qualities of plutonium available at the Metallurgical Laboratory in 42, a team under Charles M. Cooper developed a lanthium fluoride process for separating uranium and plutonium, which was chosen for the pilot separation plant. A second separation process, the bismuth phosphate process, was, sim was subsequently developed by Seaborg and Stanley G. Thompson. This process worked by toggling plutonium between its, four, its plus four and four, plus six oxidation states in solutions of bismuth phosphate in the former state and 
The plutonium was precipitated. In the latter, it stayed in the solution, and the other products were precipitated. Now, Greenwald uh, favored the bismuth phosphate process due to its corrosive nature of lanthium fluoride, and it was selected for the Hanford separation plants. Once X10 began producing plutonium, the pilot separation plant was put to the test. The first batch that was processed at 40% efficiency, but over the next few months it was raised to 90%. That's a pretty good boost. At Hanford, top priority was given to the installations in the 300 area, the contained buildings for testing materials, preparing uranium, and assembling and calibrating instrumentation. One of the buildings housed in the canning equipment of the uranium slugs, while another contained a small test reactor. Notwithstanding the high priority allocated to it, the work on the 300 area fell behind schedule due to the unique and complex nature of the 300 area facilities and wartime shortages of labor and materials. Early plans called for the construction of two separation plants, each in the areas known as 200 West and 200 East. This was subsequently reduced to two in the T and U plants a 200 west and one in the B plant at 200 east. Each separation plant consisted of four buildings, a process cell building or canyon, a concentration building, a purification building, and a magazine store. The canyons each were 800 feet long and 65 feet wide. Each consisted of 40 17.7 by 13 by 20 foot cells. Now, work began on these buildings in January of 44, with the former completed in September and the latter in December. Uh, the building following March 1945, because of the high levels of radioactivity involved, all work in the separation plants had to be conducted by remote control using closed-circuit television, something unheard of in 1943. Maintenance was carried out with the aid of an overhead crane and specially designed tools, the 224 buildings were smaller because they had less material to process and were less radioactive. The 224T and 224U buildings were completed on the 8th of October in 44, and the 224B followed on the 10th of February in 1945. Purification methods that were eventually used in 231W were still unknown when the plant commenced on the 8th of October. April 1944, but the plant was complete and the methods were selected by the end of the year. On the 5th of February 1945, Matthias hand delivered the first shipment of 80 grams of 95% pure plutonium nitrate to a Los, An to a Los Alamos courier in Los Angeles. Now, in 43, the development efforts were directed to a gun type fission weapon with plutonium called Thin Man. Initial research on the properties of plutonium was done using a cyclotron generated plutonium 239, which was extremely pure but could only be created in very small amounts. The idea behind the Thin Man design was to fire one subcritical mass of plutonium at another, with, and the collision would create a nuclear explosion. Los, Al Los Alamos received the first sample of plutonium from the Clinton 10X reactor in April of 1944, and within days, Emilio Sergi discovered a problem. The reactor bred plutonium had a higher concentrate of plutonium-240, resulting in up to five times the spontaneous fission rate of cyclotron plutonium. Seaborg had correctly predicted in March 1943 that some of the plutonium-239 would absorb a neutron to become plutonium-240. Ooh. This made the reactor plutonium unsuitable for use in a gun-type weapon. The plutonium-240 would start the chain reaction too quickly, causing predetonation that would release enough energy to disperse the critical mass within the minimal amount of plutonium uh, reacted, or known as a fizzle. A faster gun was suggested but found to be impractical, and the possibility of separating the isotopes was considered and rejected, as plutonium-240 is even harder to separate from plutonium-239 than uranium-235 from uranium-238. Now, work on an alternate... Oh, work on an alternate method of bomb design known as implosion had begun earlier in direction by physicist Seth Niedermeyer. Implosion used <coughs> explosive to crush a subcritical sphere of fizzle material into a smaller and denser form, 
When the fizzle atoms are packed closer together, the rate of fit nuclear capture increases and the mass becomes a critical mass. The mass needs to travel only a short distance, so the critical mass is assembled in a much less time than it would take to the gun method. Niedmeyer's 1943 and early 44 investigations into the implosion showed promise, but it also made it clear the problem would be much more difficult from a theoretical and engineering perspective than the gun design. In 1943 of September, John von Neumann, who had experienced uh, with shaped charges, used in armor-piercing shells, argued that not only would implosion reduce the danger of pre-detonation and fizzle, but also make a more efficient use of the fissionable material. He proposed using a spherical configuration instead of a cylindrical one that Niedermeyer was working on. Well, by July of 1944, Oppenheimer had concluded that plutonium could not be used in the gun design and opted for an implosion. The accelerated effort on the implosion design, codenamed Fat Man, began in August of 1944 when Oppenheimer implemented a sweeping reorganization of the Los Alamos laboratory to focus on implosion. Two new groups were created in Los Alamos to head the uh, implosion weapon, X for Explosives Division, which is headed by explosive expert George Kieskowski, and G for Gadget Division under Richard Bacher. The new design that Von Neumann and uh, T for Theoretical Division, most r notably Rudolf Perius, had devised using explosive lenses to focus the explosion into a spherical shape using a combination of both slow and fast high explosives. Now the design of lenses that detonated with the proper shape and velocity turned out to be slow, difficult, and frustrating. Various explosives were tested before settling on composite B as the fast explosive and baritol as the slow explosive. The final design resembled a soccer ball with 20 hexagon and 20 pentagonal lenses, each weighing about 80 pounds. Getting detonation just right, just right required fast, reliable, and safe electrical detonators of which there were two for each lens for reliability. It was therefore decided to use exploding bridge wire detonators, a new invention developed at Los Alamos by a group led by Luis Alvarez. A contract for their manufacture was given to Rayathon. Now to study the behavior of converging shock waves, Robert Sieber devised the Rala experiment in which he used the short-lived radioisotope lanthium-140, a potent source of gamma radiation. Oh, yeah. The gamma ray source was placed in the center of a metal sphere surrounded by explosive lenses, in which turn what inside was an ionization chamber. This allowed the taking of an X-ray movie of the implosion. The lenses were designed primarily using the series of tests. In the history of the Los Alamos project, David Hawkins wrote, Rala became the most important single experiment in affecting the final bomb design. Within the explosives was the 4.5 inch thick aluminum pusher which provided a smooth transition from the relatively low density explosive to the next layer a three inch thick tamper of natural uranium its main job was to hold the critical mass together as long as possible but would also reflect neutrons back into the core some part of the might some part of it might fission as well to prevent pre-detonation by an external neutron the tamper was coated in a thin layer of boron. A polonium beryllium modulated neutron initiator, known as an urchin because its shape represented a, resembled a sea urchin, was developed to start the chain reaction precisely at the right moment. This work with the chemistry and the metallurgy of radioactive polonium was directed by Charles Allen Thomas of the Monsanto Company and became known as the Dayton Project. Testing required up to 500 curies of per month of polonium, which Montesano was able to deliver. The whole assembly was encased in a delirium bomb casing to prevent it from bullets and slack. Now, the ultimate task of the metallurgist was to determine how to cast plutonium into a sphere. Uh, this difficulty became apparent when attempts to measure the density of plutonium gave inconsistent results. At first, Contamination was believed to be the cause, but it soon determined that there was multiple allotropes of plutonium. Uh, the brittle A phase exists at room temperature, changes to the plastic B phase at higher temperatures. Attention then shifted to even more malleable O phase, 
which normally exists in the 300 Celsius to 450 Celsius range. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, it was found that it's stable at room temperature when alloyed with aluminum, but aluminum emits neutrons when bombarded with alpha particles, which it would exacerbate the pre-ignition pro problem. Uh, the metallurgy then hit upon a plutonium gallium alloy, which stabilized the phase and could be hot pressed into the design, desired spherical shape. As plutonium was found to corrode readily, the sphere was then coated with nickel. This work uh, proved dangerous. By the end of the war, half the experienced chemists and metallurgists had to be removed from work with plutonium because of unacceptably high levels of the element appeared in their urine. Oops. A minor fire at the Los Alamos plant in January 1945 led to a fear that a fire in the plutonium laboratory might contaminate the whole town, and Groves authorized the construction of a new facility for plutonium chemistry and metallurgy, which became known as the DP site. The hemispheres for the plutonium pit or core were produced and delivered on the 2nd of July 1945. Three more hemispheres followed on the 23rd and were delivered three days later. Now, in contrast to the plutonium fat man, the uranium gun type little boy weapon was straightforward, if not trivial, to design. Overall responsibility for the assignment uh, went to Parsons Ordnance Division, which design department and technical work at Los Alamos consolidated under Lieutenant Commander Francis Birch's group. This gun type now had to work with enriched uranium only, and this allowed the design to be greatly simplified. A high velocity gun was no longer required. The simple weapon was substituted. Now, have you all been waiting for Trinity? Now, because of the complexity of the implosion-style weapon, it was decided that despite the waste of fissile material, an initial test would be required. Grove approved the test, subject and active material be recovered. Consideration was therefore given to a controlled fizzle, but Oppenheimer opted instead to the full-scale nuclear test, codenamed Trinity. In March of 1944, planning for the test was assigned to Kenneth Bainbridge, a professor of physics at Harvard, working under Tchaikovsky. Bainbridge selected the bombing range near Almogordo Army Airfield as the site for the test. Bainbridge worked with Captain Samuel P. Davalos on the construction of the Trinity Base Camp and its facilities, which included barracks, houses, uh, warehouses, workshops, an explosive magazine, and a commissary. Make sure you get your candy bar before you Ooh. blow something up, kids. Yum, yum. Groves did not relish the prospect of explaining to a Senate committee the loss of a billion dollars worth of plutonium. What? So a cylindrical containment vessel codenamed Jumbo was constructed to recover the active material in the event of a failure. Measuring 25 feet long and 12 feet wide, it was fabricated at great expense from 204 short tons of iron and steel from Babcock and Wilcox in Barberton, Ohio. Brought by special railroad car to the siding in Pope, New Mexico, it was transported the last 25 miles to the test site on a trailer pulled by two tractors. By the time it arrived, however, confidence in an implosion method was high enough and the availability of plutonium sufficient, and Oppenheimer decided not to use it. Instead, what? it was placed on the top of a steel tower 800 yards from the weapon as a rough measure of how powerful the explosion would be. In the end, Jumbo survived, although the tower did not, adding credence to the belief that Jumbo would have successfully contained a fizzled explosion. Now, a pre-test explosion was conducted on the 7th of May, 1945, to calibrate instruments. A wooden test platform was erected 800 yards from ground zero and piled with 100 short tons of TNT spiked with nuclear fission products in the form of a radium-uranium slug from Hanford which was dissolved and poured inside a tubing inside the explosives. This explosion was observed by Oppenheimer and Grove's new deputy commander, Brigadier General Thomas Farrell. This pretest produced data that proved vital to the Trinity test. Now, for the actual test, the weapon, we could take and have some fun here and ask, see if who's still paying attention to the video. Nobody. The test was nicknamed the Gadget. Gadget. Now it was hosted on go, top. Go gadget. Go go gadget. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was hoisted on top of a 100 foot tower, steel tower, and the detonation at that height would give a better indication of how the weapon would behave when dropped from a bomber. Detonation in the air maximized the energy and applied directly to the target and generated less nuclear fallout. The gadget was 
assembled under the supervision of Norris Bradbury on the nearby McDonald Ranch House on the 13th of July and precariously winched up to the tower the following day. Observers included Bush, Chadwick, Conant, Farrell, Fermi, Groves, Lawrence, Oppenheimer, and Tolman. Now, I did remember reading another article that I saw today, and it talked about the last guy on that tower. He had to climb up and basically arm the device, and he was the last person to see the gadget. On the uh, 5.30 in the morning on the 16th of July, 1945, the gadget exploded. It had the equivalent energy of around 20 kilotons of TNT, leaving a crater of trentonite, or radioactive glass in the desert, 250 feet wide. The shock wave was felt over 100 miles away, and the mushroom cloud reached 7.5 miles in height. They said it was heard as far away as El Paso, Texas. Wow. And so real quickly, uh, to cover any questions, uh, Groves issued a cover story about an ammunition magazine explosion at the Almogordo Field. Uh, Oppenheimer later recalled that while witnessing the explosion, he thought of a verse from the Hindu holy book, the Bhagavad Gita. If the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst into at once into the sky, it would be like the splendor of the Mighty One. Years later, he would explain that another verse had also entered his head at that time, said, We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty, and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. But officially, that's where the beginning of the nuclear age came from. More or less. But this has been uh, the Bearded Historian for the Bud Files. You folks have a uh, good time out there, and uh, we will talk to you next week. <laughs>